Hi and welcome to Enchantment of Eternity's Game of Thrones video on an analysis of Arya Stark's storyline part 2. This video is part 2 of 2 where I recap, analyze, and comment on Arya Stark's storyline up to the end of season 7. You should have already watched part 1 of this analysis where I covered Arya's journey from season 1 up to season 3. If you haven't, you should check that out first, link will be in the description below. In this video, I will cover her journey from Season 4 to the end of Season 7, so I have to start with a spoiler warning for Game of Thrones up to the end of Season 7. If you haven't seen up to this point, you may not want to watch this video, otherwise some things will be spoiled for you. So let's begin with Arya's uh, Season 4 storyline. So Season 4 begins with Arya still with the Hound traveling through the Riverlands. Arya complains about uh, wanting her own horse, but the Hound is worried she'll try to escape. But Arya counters that she has nowhere to escape to, that her family is all dead, and she'd die without his protection. And this is an interesting turn in Arya's character, because before she would be loath to admit that she needs the Hound's protection, and would foolishly insist she'd be fine on her own. However, seeing her entire family's forces murdered in front of her and seeing her dead brother's body being paraded around with the wolf's head sewn on and uh, listening to men brag about slitting her mother's throat has really changed her outlook on life and she realizes that the world is a very dangerous place for her. Anyway, the Hound explains he's taking her to her rich aunt Liza in the Vale in order to collect a reward. Arya has never met her, so doesn't have any particularly feelings about uh, her, but the Hound seems to imply at least she'll be safe with her. They then come across an inn where they are uh, hungry and want food, but they spot Lannister soldiers there and see five horses indicating there are five soldiers there. The Hound doesn't want to risk taking on that many soldiers. However, Arya spots Polliver, the man who stole her sword, Needle, and killed her friend Lamy. Polliver was in fact mentioned on her kill list, so she runs into the inn before the Hound can stop her. And once they're spotted, the Hound decides to go in anyway where they see the Lannister soldiers harassing the innkeeper and his daughter. Polliver um, sees them and says, I know you, and Arya thinks he's talking to her, but he's talking to the Hound, whom he recognizes, so he comes over to talk to the Hound. He makes small talk and eventually invites the Hound with them on their way back to King's Landing, where he says they can do whatever they like, which of course means harass and take whatever they want from the locals. When Polliver brags about wearing the king's colors, the hound simply says, fuck the king. And that makes everyone stop what they're doing and look at him, and an eeriness befalls the room. But more than that, you can see Arya's kind of smile. And you can tell she's very happy with the hound right now. Even though she reports to hate him, she loves, first of all, that the hound would degrade Joffrey like that in public, but also that he would stand up to Pulliver and not take any shit from him. Uh, she seems to uh, look to Pulliver with interest now, wondering what he'll do next. Polliver doesn't instantly react, but his tone changes as he brings up the fact that he heard the hound was a deserter. But the hound ignores him and asks for a chicken. So Polliver asks if he's paid for a chicken, the hound responds by asking if he's paid. Polliver says that they're the king's men, so they don't need to pay. He then offers a trade, a chicken for one of his men can have some time with Arya. Arya doesn't look too concerned, more disgusted, because I think she knows that the Hound wouldn't give her up like that, and indeed, he ignores the offer and calls Polliver a talker and says listening to talkers makes him thirsty, and he reaches across the table and drinks the rest of Polliver's drink. And then he then says, oh, it also makes me hungry, and then insists on two chickens now. Polliver asks if he wants to die over some chickens, but the hound responds that someone will. Now, it's obvious that it isn't about the chickens. It's about the hound not wanting to give in to these fuckers, and it's funny because the hound didn't want to confront them at all, but now that he's in this situation, he refuses to back down. So... Just like that, he knew <coughs> would happen. A fight breaks out as Polliver reaches for his sword and the Hound responds by flipping the table and jumping to his feet. Now what's interesting is that Arya instantly jumps to her feet as well, almost as if she was ready for the coming fight. But this time, Arya knows enough to stay back against the wall as the Hound takes on Polliver and his men. The innkeeper and his daughter run upstairs to get away from the fight, but Arya stays downstairs 
Uh, so uh, she's still close to it, but still she's against the wall, out of harm's way. Now, this is the humility that she learned from being with the Brotherhood Without Banners, as her younger self might charge into the fight foolhardy, but she recognizes now that she's not skilled enough uh, yet to be of any use. However, she stays close by, and you can tell she's always at the ready. And, of course, her fate hangs in the balance as if the Hound loses, it wouldn't be good for her. So the fight itself is more raw and brutal than anything she's seen before. Sure, she's seen men dying in sword fighting before, like when Yurin and the Night's Watch recruits took on the Lannister men and lost, but this is more like a bar fight that's a lot more gory and raw as the Hound put a sword through a man's genitals and then stabbed another in the eye repeatedly until his eye fell out. And Arya is not at all off-put by this, in fact, she seems excited by it. She's worried about the Hound, and when the Hound gets penned by a guy, you can see her contemplate whether or not she should intercede on his behalf, but still isn't really sure of herself, but the Hound takes care of him himself. But she spots a few of the men the Hound had knocked to the ground, but not killed, starting to get up, so uh, now she can see that the Hound has the advantage. She decides to step in and stop the guards from getting up before he loses that advantage. She sneaks up behind on a guy and knocks him out by smashing his head with a pot, and then steals his sword and kills him with it. She then sneaks up behind Pulver, who has he's charging toward the Hound, and swipes at his legs behind him until he's stuck on the ground. She then stands over him and taunts him by repeating the same thing that he had said to Lamy just before killing him, asking if she needs to carry him. This confuses Pulver, so Arya takes the needle back from him and says, oh, it's a fine sword, maybe I'll pick my teeth with it, which is exactly what he said to her when he took her, uh, the sword from her. And finally, he recognizes her, and that look of recognition uh, just before um, she kills him is the exact same manner that he killed Lamy by stabbing him with a needle through his head. And what's really important about the scene is the look of pure pleasure on her face when she kills him. One might even describe it as an evil look. Sure, Pulliver was a bad man, but most people new to killing, especially young girls, would be disgusted or at least shaken by uh, uh, taking another man's life. But she's not at all. She takes pure pleasure out of it, the kind of way a serial killer might, and although Pulliver isn't the first man she's killed, he is the first one on her kill list that she's killed. And so, uh, some may have taught her that her, I uh, thought that her kill list was just wishful thinking or theoretical, and once she actually did it, that uh, the reality wouldn't be what she expected or she wouldn't be able to do it, but that's completely was not the case with her, and I suspect this had a lot to do with all of the trauma and tragedy that she's experienced in her life, particularly just having come from the Red Wedding, which was particularly traumatic. I believe this made her a bit uh, more cold and without a conscience, much in the same way a serial killer might be. And we then see the Hound and Arya right away. And Arya has her own horse now, uh, just like she wanted, and she has a humongous smile on her face uh, just after she murdered two men in cold blood, and just having watched the Hound kill several people, including stabbing the guy's eyes out until it falls out. And the Hound, of course, is eating some chicken, so he's happy. So they're both happy, huge smiles on their faces as they ride off into the countryside, which is scorched and burning, a horrific and mortifying scene, which they are, they're completely oblivious to. Now, you may have noticed I spent a long time on this one scene, but not only do I find it very significant to Arya's storyline, in fact, I may even be as bold as to say this was the defining moment for Arya's character. This also may well be my favorite scene in the entire show. So it's hard for me not to spend a long time gushing about this scene, how absolutely amazing it is, and that this is one of the best scenes in television, even cinematic history. But I don't want to get too bogged down in that, but I will say that Maisie Williams' acting in this scene was simply divine. But getting back to the analysis mode here, 
This is one of the main reasons why I refer to the Hound as one of Arya's mentors. Because it's obvious from this scene that she's learning from him. Not just the brutal and raw way that he kills indiscriminately, but how casual he is about it as if it's no big deal. And she is in fact thankful to him for helping her kill a name on her list. And so even though she won't admit it to herself, I do believe she's becoming close to the Hound here, which is interesting. So we then follow Ari and Hound on their journey through the Riverlands. They stop at a creek to water their horses and come across a farmer whose land they're on. The Hound is rude and confrontational with him, but Arya takes over and makes up a story about how the Hound is her father and her mother died uh, when their cottage was burned down in the war and that the Hound served the Tollies. So the farmer offers them food and a place to sleep for the night. So this shows that Arya has already become a bit of a skilled a liar and she's good at pretending to be someone else, a skill that she will later refine. So at dinner, uh, the hound is being rather rude and Arya tries to apologize for him, but then the farmer starts talking about the Red Wedding and how disgusting it is that the phrase violated guest rights. The hound kind of dismisses it, but the farmer goes on to talk about how the gods will have their vengeance on the phrase, and Arya has gone dead silent at this point. As you can tell, this is really getting to her, and getting vengeance on the phrase is a very important thing to her. The farmer then offers to pay the hound to protect his farm, and he agrees, which Arya knows he doesn't mean because she knows that he's plan he's not planning on staying. And indeed, as she wakes up the next morning to find the hound has knocked out the farmer and stole his silver. This really upsets Arya that he stole from those who were kind to them, which is interesting because although we saw the bloodlust and the lust to kill is coming uh, very strong in Arya, but she's not indiscriminate about who she likes. Uh, like the hound is and, and can still distinguish between innocent victims and, or at least those who are kind of uh, who she thinks uh, deserve uh, this kind of treatment but the hound insists that uh, the farmers will be dead uh, come winter regardless of what they do so uh, they won't need their silver when Arya calls him the worst shit in the Seven Kingdoms, he says that he just understands the way things are and asks how many Starks have to, how many more Starks have to lose their heads before she figures it out. Which I'm sure cut really deep and is a lesson she probably took to heart that is trying to protect everyone in this cruel world is an impossible task. So then we see them preparing to sleep by a campfire at night where Arya says her kill list before going to bed and insists that she can't sleep until saying the names and her list has grown quite long now. As in addition to Joffrey, Cersei, the Mountain, and Ill and Payne, she's added Marin Trant, uh, Tywin Lannister, Walder Frey, Beric and Darien, Thoris of Myr, and uh, the Red Woman. Now, some names didn't do that much to her, like Beric and Thoros, and some had wronged her before and were just now at it, like Marin Trant. Uh, it just illustrates how fueled by hate and revenge that she's become. The Hound seems to approve of this list, saying that hate is as good a thing as any to keep a person going, illustrating that Arya is becoming more like him. However, he wants her to finish the list so he can just go to sleep, and she simply says one last name, The Hound. I think he's actually hurt by this because I think she actually, he's starting to actually care about her and is tr trying to teach her for her own benefit, but Arya still resents him. The Hound wakes up to see Arya trying to, uh, training and doing her water dance with Needle uh, the way Cyril Pharrell had taught her and he mocks her for it saying fighting isn't about dancing. <laughs> Arya then insists it was taught to her by the greatest swordsman who ever was, and, and that person was killed by Marin Trant. And the Hound can't believe this, as Marin Trant is a terrible swordsman, but Arya explains that Ciri was outnumbered and only had a wooden stick. And the Hound simply mocks him, says that he's dead like the rest of her friends. Now this hits a sore spot with Arya, who stabs the Hound with needle, but the sword just bounces off his armor, not and not not taking too kindly to the attempt on his life, he smacks her and tells her that his friend is dead and Trant 
isn't because Trent had a big sword and armor and her friend did not. So as much as this pissed Arya off at the time, I do think this is another important lesson that she took to heart and makes her re-examine Serial's death and how uh, there is no glory or honor or you know whatever um, whenever someone has the bigger sword wins. Uh, glory and honor don't really make it much of a difference. Again, the Hound is painting the world as a dangerous and chaotic place where only the strongest and most brutish survive. This also speaks to uh, his upbringing, but I won't get too much into that here. Next on their journey, they come across a farmer who is dying after being attacked by bandits. The Hound tries to uh, talk him into a mercy kill as he's going to slowly die either way. Arya seems to agree that this is the best choice for him and tries to talk him into it as well. What's interesting is that when he asks her who she is, uh, says she doesn't lie and she just says straight up she's Arya Stark. And I think uh, she saw it as important to be honest to a dying man. Uh, the Hound then kills him and tells Arya that's where the heart is. The Hound is then attacked by Rorge and Biter, the two men that were in the wagon with Jack and Hagar who were cruel to Arya. After the Hound fights off Biter, he confronts Rorge who explains that there's a price on his head and also that Joffrey is dead. When Arya recognizes him, the Hound asks if he's on her list and Arya states that he can't be because she doesn't know his name. So the Hound asks his name and once he says it, Arya kills him by stabbing him in the heart with needle. The Hound, like a proud father, says, oh, you're learning. So this is interesting because they're bonding. First over the mercy killing a dying man, which Arya agreed with was the right thing to do. And then with the Hound letting her kill a man that she wants revenge on and helping her to do it. Uh, so even though she may not admit it, I believe she is growing close to the Hound. We then get more bonding between them as the Hound tries to treat his bite wound and Arya tries to help him do it and does... Um, so it does look like she cares about him. However, the fear of fire wins out and he lashes out at her saying that uh, she's the worst thing that ever happened to him. He then opens up about why he's so afraid of fire and what his brother did to him by scarring his face, saying that the worst thing is, is that it was his own brother that did it to him, but she has a brother who would give him give her a nice sword, so she has it much better. So I think this is more bonding as Arya talks him into letting her sew the wound instead. So again, even though neither will admit it, the two of them are really bonding. In fact, she may be a bonding with this mentor even more than she did with her previous mentors. We then see Arya and the Hound finally arrive at the Vale as they approach the bloody gate of the Eyrie to get to her Aunt Liza. On the way, they talk about how Joffrey died and how Arya isn't really happy about it because she didn't get to do it herself. The Hound retorts that nothing makes her happy, but she says killing Polliver made her happy and killing Rurge uh, made her happy. So again, emphasizing her bloodlust, and that's the only thing that's keeping her alive is revenge. The Hound says uh, that being poisoned by wine is a pathetic way to kill someone, but Arya remarks that's a prideful remark and the reason why he will never be a good killer because she would kill someone uh, that she wants to kill any way that she has to. Uh, which again is interesting, as although she's learned a lot from the Hound, she has had other teachers as well, and her blood loss is the most important thing to her. Uh, how she does it isn't an issue. So when they arrive at the Bloody Gate, uh, the Hound uh, seeks an audience with Liza so he can sell her uh, her niece. Uh, the guard informs them, however, that Liza has died three days earlier, and then in response, Arya just burst out into hysterical laughter. The garden hound look at her like she's crazy, but she continues to just laugh. Now, that was an amazing scene. I love this scene because it illustrates how common it is for anyone uh, who is connected to her uh, to die. It's become so commonplace that she's gotten used to it. And also that whenever she's about to be reunited with the family, that family is killed. So it's almost like a hysterical laughter, but it's... It shows how cold that she's grown to the world, and now she thinks it's funny how cruel her fates are. Of course, she didn't know Liza personally, so it doesn't really mourn her personally uh, at this stage, so just this has a laugh about how her family just keep dying all around her. 
So we catch up to Arya and the Hound in the Vale. It's never stated where they're headed to now. They may not even know themselves. At this stage, Arya has given up the prospect of ever finding safe haven. Uh, while Arya is practicing her water dancing, she comes across Brienne of Tarth and is suspicious of her at first until she sees that uh, Brienne has a male squire and is so delighted by the sight of a female knight. She explains that she isn't a knight, but Arya still sees the sight of a female warrior as inspiring, and they trade their names about their swords. Uh, this is until the Hound comes by her side, and Podrick Payne instantly recognizes him, so then Brienne realizes uh, that uh, who she is and that she's Arya. Brienne then insists that she swore an oath to her mother to protect her, but Arya seems dubious and asks why she didn't protect her mother. The Hound then confronts her uh, and her sword, saying that he knows uh, that he, she uh, was paid by the Lannisters because he can recognize Lannister gold. But Brienne insists that she's there to protect Arya and to take her to safety. But the Hound replies by saying there's no such thing as safety, and she does, if she doesn't know that, then she's the wrong person to look after her. It does appear to her that Brienne's optimism is misguided, but Brienne simply asks the Hound if that's what he's doing, looking after Arya, and he says that it is. So I think here is where the Hound finally admits to himself that he cares about Arya and that he is looking after her and he doesn't want her to go uh, with someone who he deems ill-equipped to protect her. But Brienne insists that she's coming with her one way or the other, so her and the Hound get into a long, very brutal fight to the death over Arya. While Arya hides and seems somewhat interested in the outcome. After a long, bloody fight, Brienne defeats the Hound, who falls off a cliff and is left broken, bloody, and dying. Uh, Brienne looks for Arya, but she hides from her, and once Brienne has moved on, Arya comes out of hiding to come to the Hound, who is lying on the ground, dying. The Hound tells her that she should go with Brienne, uh, because she won't last long on her own, but she simply retorts that she'll last longer than him. He then asks her to mercy kill him, but she just sits there silently. Uh, he then tries to taunt her by bragging about killing the butcher's boy and saying that he should have raped her sister. He doesn't really mean it, he's just trying to give her a good reason to kill him and scratch a name off of her list. And when she gets close to him, it looks like that she will kill him, but instead she swipes the bag of silver from him and walks away, leaving him there to die a slow death while he begs for her to kill him. Now, I'm sure she told herself the reason she didn't kill him is that a slow death would be more agonizing for him, but we later learn there's more to it than that, but I'll cover that when we get to it. So Arya rides off on her own until she spots a port and rides uh, towards it to find a ship and a captain and tries to book passage north to the wall, but the captain refuses, saying that they're not headed north, they're heading home, and when Arya asks where that is, he reveals it is Bravos. So Arya uh, remembers the coin that Jack and Hagar gave her, shows it to him, and repeats the words of Valor Magulis. The captain then immediately changes his attitude and almost bows to her, saying that of course she will have her own cabin on his ship. And thus we see Arya riding out to sea on her way to Bravos. So it's interesting that her first instinct was to ask to go back to her half-brother John, the sibling that she was always closest to, and only uh, and the only one she knows that is still alive and in safety. But when she uh, hears the opportunity of going to Bravos, she jumps all over that. Now you could say that it's happenstance that she chose the life of becoming killer rather than returning to her family. Uh, you know, that it, it was just happenstance why she chose that. However, she could have just as easily tried to find another ship that would take her north. But the prospect of going to Bravos and being reunited with Jack and Hagar, who promised to train her to become an assassin, was too much to turn down because, as I mentioned, the need for revenge and to kill her enemies is the main thing that's keeping her going. So that brings us to her Season 5 storyline, which begins with Arya arriving in Bravos, where the captain takes her to the House of Black and White, where she reported uh, to be the home of the Faceless Men. However, when Arya knocks on the door, an older man answers, and when she asks for Jack and Agar, he simply says there's no one here by that name, and slams the door on her. 
She sits by the door and waits. At night, she says her prayer list of the names she wants to kill, and that list has gotten a lot smaller now, as now it only contains four names, Cersei, Man, Trant, Walder Frey, and the Mountain. Some of those names that were on her list before are no longer there are people of names of people who are now dead, like Joffrey and Tywin Lannister, but other names like Ilan Payne, Beric, uh, Dendarrion, Thoris of Mir, and the Red Woman. Uh, I feel Arya has kind of just forgotten about and deemed them as not as important. As time passed, she had more time to move past her trauma. I believe she's learned now to focus her efforts and instead focuses on the four names that are most important to her, uh, rather than anyone who has ever done the tiniest, you know, wrong to her. So Cersei... Uh, is on there uh, for betraying and killing her father, Maren Trant for killing her first mentor, Serial Pharrell, the Mountain for being the man in charge of the Lannister forces that killed her second mentor, Euron, and who tortured and killed innocent villagers around her, and Walder Frey who betrayed and murdered her mother and brother. And I think she realizes that those are the names that are most important to her. However, after days uh, pass with her waiting outside the house of black and white and nothing happening, she gives up, throws the coin uh, that Jack and Hank gave her into the water, and moves on. We then see Arya in the streets of Bravos, where she kills a pigeon with clean proficiency. This is in contrast to when she was in the streets of King's Landing in Season 1 and had a hard time killing a pigeon. Uh, so it shows that she has grown and has learned some skills. Uh, she runs into some street thugs that attempt to rob her, but she pulls out her sword and simply commands them to turn around and leave. The thugs persist, though, and say that her sword is worth a lot, but she responds by saying nothing is worth anything. Anything to dead men. Now, I remember when this episode first aired, I got into a huge, long, drawn-out argument with someone in the comments section about whether this was foolish of Arya to behave in this way and whether or not she would actually win this fight. I'm still not certain if she'd win this fight. I guess we'll never know, but I still very firmly believe this was not as foolish uh, as her to do, and I believe she behaved the way that she should have, as regardless of whether she could win the fight, to show weakness or to try to run would not have been the right thing to do, and I don't think Arya is foolish or overconfident, as I pointed out in the confrontation at the end, but she no longer has the hound to protect her and knows that she needs to stand up for herself. Personally, I think she's learned a lot from skilled mentors, uh, most recently in the house. So I think she would have been able to take these common street thugs, but that's just me. But, as I said, we don't find out because the same man from the House of Black and White shows up, which immediately scares off the thugs. Arya follows him back to the House of Black and White, uh, where she demands to know who he is. He responds by simply tossing her the coin back to her, the one that she had thrown in the water, and saying that she lost it. The man then removes a face to reveal Jack and Hagar. Arya upset says that he said that there was no Jack and Hagar there, and he replies by saying there isn't because he is no one, and uh, that is what Arya needs to become as well. So this is where we're introduced to the concept of the faceless men having no identity and referring to themselves as no one. It's not clear on whether or not this man is the same man that Arya met in the Riverlands, but I think that's ultimately irrelevant given the nature of the faceless men, which is to have no real identity of their own. Uh, we see her sweeping the floors of the house of black and white as men come to this place to die as uh, Jacken gives them water from a fountain that then kills them. Arya goes to Jack and complains that she's been sweeping the floors for days, uh, which he says is good because she needs to learn how to serve. When Arya insists that she does want to serve, Jack encounters that she only wants to serve herself, where here they serve the many-faced god. When Arya asks about uh, which god that is, as she sees idols to many different gods of many different religions, Jack says there's only one god and she knows his name. This is a nice callback to Cyril Pharrell, who used to tell her there was only one god, the god of death. Uh, this is also a lesson Arya has learned repeatedly on her journeys and something the Faceless Men are all about, so it does seem like she's come to the right place, even as she hasn't learned how uh, to fit in quite yet. So Arya is then confronted by another servant girl in the House of Black and White, whom for clarity's sake I will refer to as the Waif. 
Uh, so the waif confronts Arya by saying she didn't earn the coin, nor does she respect it. So she asked her repeatedly who she is, and Arya, learning from what Jackin has been saying about how she needs to be no one, replies that she is no one, but every time she does, the waif hits her. Arya gets frustrated and reaches for her sword, but Jackin interrupts, asking the waif what she's doing, and she says that she's playing the game of faces, to which Jackin replies by saying Arya isn't ready. Arya insists that she is ready to be no one, but Jackin then asks, why is no one surrounded by Arya Stark's things? Her sword, her stolen silver, and her clothes. Taking the hint, Arya then gathers up all of her things and throws them in the water. However, when it comes time to cast off Needle, she's unable to do it and instead hides the sword underneath some rocks. This of course is really significant as it proves Arya isn't ready to become no one and that she's still not uh, willing to let go of her closest ties with her family, namely her sword needle. However, having thrown away uh, all of her other things has shown Jackin that she is ready for the next step and instead of sweeping floors, he gives her the task of cleaning dead bodies. The next time we see Arya, it is implied a significant amount of time has passed in which she has been performing menial tasks such as cleaning bodies and thus being taught humil humility and learning to be a servant. This is in fact a significant change of pace in Arya as she's used to living a life of high adventure, always on the run, always in danger, as she's lived that way for years now, so it's quite significant that now uh, she has to lead what many would uh, consider a dull life. And you can see she does get bored of it, but ultimately she's willing to stick with it because she wants to become an unstoppable assassin. But her impatience does get the better of her, and she tries to see where they're taking these bodies that they're claiming, but the wave stops her and tells her to get back to work. Arya then asks if she can play the game of faces again, so the wave asks her who she is, to which she replies she's no one, and the waif is unhappy with this answer and tells her to get back to work, so Arya then asks her who she is. The waif then responds with a story about how she was also from Westeros and the daughter of a lord who married a woman that tried to have her poisoned, so she turned to the faceless men for help. Arya smiles at her, having a feeling of kinship with her now, but the waif then destroys that feeling by asking her if what she just said was true or not. This catches Arya off guard, who did take it as f at face value, but the wave asks if she believed every word she said, and thus Arya is learning the game of faces. It's about being able to present yourself as someone else in order to become someone else. That night, Jack and Hagar comes to her while she's sleeping and asks who she is. This time, she answers that she's Arya, and then he asks where she's from, and then she answers. She talks about her backstory and her father, Ned, but once in a while, she slips in a lie, like saying her father died in battle, but every time she does, Jack and spots it and smacks her and points out it's a lie. Even if it's a small lie, like when she said that she had to kill a stable boy by driving her sword through his back when really it was his gut, but Jack can, can still spot a lie. She then describes how she was taken in by an outlaw named Polliver, so Jacken smacks her, and she corrects herself to Hound, but then goes on to describe how he was wounded in the fight, and she left him to die because she hated him and wanted him to suffer, but Jacken smacks her. She repeats that she wanted him to die, but Jacken smacks her again and again. She angry protests, saying that that isn't a lie, but uh, Jacken says that uh, she's lying to him and herself. Now, this part is very interesting as it does reveal that Arya did in fact care about the Hound and was lying to herself when she thought she was leaving him for dead because she wanted him to suffer when in actuality, she simply couldn't bring herself to be the one who killed him because she loved him as a mentor, as a father figure, and that's not something she'd admit even to herself. But when Jacken could see through that, uh, and he asks her if she really wants to be no one, which she answers yes with a lot of conviction, but Jacken smacks her so hard she bleeds from it. Again, Jacken knows uh, that she did hide Needle and thus isn't willing to give up her identity of Arya Stark uh, and become a no one, uh, but more on this later on. 
So later, uh, Arya is sweeping the floors when the man comes in with his sick daughter. He comes to her and asks for help, saying that he's tried everything to save her, but no one can, and he just wants her suffering to end. So Arya goes to the little girl and makes up a story, again with some truth to it, where he tell, where she tells her uh, that Arya's father uh, cared about her just as much as the girl's father cares about her, and then tells her if she drinks from the fountain that her suffering will end, so she does, and of course this kills her, but more much like the dying farmer, Arya sees it as a mercy. Jacken in the corner sees this and is impressed that Arya was able to convince the girl to drink and to soothe her in her death by pretending to be someone else. So he opens up the door where the bodies go to uh, and uh, Arya enters to discover a large room with a countless amount of faces on the wall. However, Jacken says that she's not ready to become no one, but she is ready to become someone else. The next time we see Arya, we see that she has indeed become someone else. She's uh, taking on the identity of Lana, who sells oysters on the shore. We see her tell uh, the story of her new identity to Jacken, who seems impressed. He then sends her to the docks to test her to see what she sees. And we see her traveling around the docks as she shouts, Oysters, clams, and cockles! Uh, she comes across a man that Jacken will refer to as the Thin Man doing some shady stuff. Jacken refers to him as a gambler who gambles on whether or not sailors will come back alive. Arya asks Jacken for clarification, but he refuses, telling her to reason it out on her own. So she does, and basically the Thin Man is a life insurance broker who sailors pay to give a large payout to their families in the case of their death. However, Jacken implies that the Thin Man had refused to pay out when he should have, and so the family uh, that got screwed turned to the faceless men. So the, he then sends Arya on an assignment to learn as much as she can about the thin man and then kill him. He hands her a vile poison to use in order to kill him with, and Arya agrees. Now this shows that Arya has indeed become the faithful student, as she does indeed really desire above all else to become a proficient killer, and seeing the thin man as a scummy and despicable man, she has no problem with killing him. So she returns to the docks and comes across the same thugs that she had encountered earlier, but they just make a crude joke and move on, clearly not recognizing her, illustrating that she is in fact doing a good job at becoming someone else. We see her get the poison ready, ready to kill the thin man, but when it comes time to do it, something else catches her eyes as she sees a group of Lannister men from King's Landing preparing to dock, and they are led by none other than Marin Trant, the man who killed her mentor, Sirio Pharrell, and uh, he has been on her kill list from the very beginning. She completely ignores the thin man who is calling to her for some oysters, which was supposed to be used to kill him with, but she doesn't care at all and instead is fixated on Marin Trant. She follows him and spies on him as he escorts a dignitary from King's Landing as he conducts, uh, conducts negotiations. Arya waits and watches them until Trant is off duty and he and a couple of his men go to a brothel. She follows them there and watches as he and his men are in the back room and Trant rejects all the prostitutes offered to him as he feels they are too old until he sees a young girl around 12 and accepts her. At one stage, the last their soldier spots uh, Arya and uh, clearly she was caught off guard uh, because she was so engrossed in observing Marin Trant but the soldier only sees her as someone selling oysters so brings her in so the men can buy some. Uh, Trant glances at her which Arya is obviously scared he'll recognize her but he doesn't but still is rather careless of her. When Arya returns to the House of Black and White, Jacken asks how it went with the thin man, and she simply says that he wasn't hungry today, which Jacken replies, well, perhaps that's why he's thin. But really, Jacken most definitely can see through her lies because he always can. He's just giving her the chance to fail on her own. So, we then see Marin Trent is back at the brothel, and he's beating small girls to get his kicks. However, one of them refuses to scream when he beats her, so he sends the other girls away and focuses on her. However, out of nowhere, she looks up and takes off her face, and surprise, surprise, it's Arya. Uh, he, she then stabs Marin Trent in both of his eyes and proceeds to stab him over and over and over again uh, in the most brutal ways. She then takes a moment while he's still alive to taunt him, and she talks 
talks about how he was the first person on her list for killing Cyril Pharrell. What's interesting is she talks about how she got a few others on her list, but the mini face god stole a couple from her, but she's glad that he left Trant for her. That's not really how it works, as she uh, is kind of misusing the many-faced god uh, here in the way that the faceless men would not approve, as in their beliefs, all deaths belong to the many-faced god and nothing belongs to her, but that's not how she sees it. She asks Trent if he knows who she is, and when he doesn't answer, she stabs him again. Uh, she then declares proudly that she's Arya Stark, uh, but he is no one, nothing. Again, this completely goes against her faceless men training, as she's supposed to be no one, not him. He's supposed to be a man who receives the gift of death from the many-faced god, but Arya is not at all presenting death as a gift. Also, killing is not meant to be done out of pleasure for the faceless men, which it most certainly is here, as Arya obviously gets extreme pleasure out of killing him, which continues her bloodlust. When Ari goes to the Hall of Faces to return the face she borrowed, a Jacken and the Waif confront her, and Jacken points out that she took the wrong life. The Waif then grabs her from behind, and Jacken tells her she stole from the Many Face God, uh, as that life wasn't hers to take, and only death can pay for life. And he gets out the poison, and the Waif holds her mouth open like he's going to give it to her, but instead he drinks it himself and falls to the floor dead. Arya immediately runs to him, crying, asking him not to die, as it's evident she's saddened by his death as she does see him as another close mentor that she cares about. The Waif asks why she's crying, and she says that he was her friend, but the Waif said that he wasn't, and then the next time Arya turns around, the Waif has suddenly transformed into Jack and Agar, and says that he was no one. Arya is now really confused and wonders who it was who just died, and she begins taking off his face, uh, all these different faces, but every time she takes a face off, she finds another face there uh, that can be removed. The whole time, Jacken is talking, saying that the faces are for no one, and she is still someone and to someone the faces are as good as poison. She then tears off the last face to see her own face and then she goes completely blind. Now I'd be lying if I said I fully understood the scene. I think it's meant to be a bit confusing and trippy. I'm still not sure how she could see her own face but it is meant to illustrate that the faceless men are not individuals. The whole point of them is that they were without their own identity, and so Arya killing someone for her own reasons goes against that and proves that she has an identity and thus is being punished for doing so. As for who it was that died, I don't think that particularly matters, but if I were to guess, I'd say it wasn't the same man she encountered in the Riverlands, but again, that's kind of beside the point. So that brings us to Season 6, in which her storyline begins with her uh, being a blind beggar on the streets, as apparently not only do the faceless men make her blind, but they also cast her out into the streets and made her beg to survive. However, while she's on the streets, she gets a visit from the Waif, who tosses a staff at her and tells her to defend herself. When she tries to protest that she can't see, the Waif doesn't care and attacks her anyway, and naturally Arya, uh, being blind, gets her ass kicked. The Waif pays her several such visits where she kicks her ass until Jacken finally shows up and tells Arya if she says her name he will give her food, shelter and her eyesight back but each time Arya insists that she has no name. So Jacken lets her back into the house of black and white and tells her to leave her pan behind as she's not a beggar anymore. So this is probably part of part punishment and part training. Although it's obvious the Waif gets a perverse pleasure out of this. She can at least on uh, Jacken's part this is meant to be more of a learning exercise to teach her the importance of being no one and how to use her other senses. So she returns to the House of Black and White to continue her training. However, she is still blind. She does uh, regular fighting sessions with the Wave, in which the Wave doesn't hold back because she's blind and still beats the crap out of her, where she becomes bruised and bloody, but Arya persists and never gives up. She also plays the game of faces with the Wave, and she smacks her whenever she lies. This time, when she asks Arya about the Hound, she's honest with herself and admits that she had taken him off of her kill list by the time that she left him for dead and she was conflicted about his death. 
So this is interesting as it so shows that she has grown a lot to recognize her own feelings and not be so conflicted. One might even say she's become more in tune to her own feelings and more at peace. So she continues her training over what is suggested to be a long time, possibly over a year, where she always persists no matter how badly she's beaten until during one of her fights with the wave she manages to strike her back and then she blocks her blow. Jacken is apparently impressed by this and offers her her sight back and pours her a cup from the poison fountain that we saw earlier kills people, but he insists that if she is truly no one, it will give her her sight back, so she drinks it and does indeed regain her sight. Jacken asks her who she is, and she says no one. So Arya has learned a lot of things from her previous mentor. She's learned how to fight and be agile from Serial Pharrell. She's learned how to lie and pretend to be someone else that she isn't. And how to hate from Euron. Uh, she's learned how to be brutal and how to, to defend herself from the brutal world from the Hound. But from Jacken, she's learned discipline and learned how to hone her skills to actually become a proficient killer. We saw from her encounter with Pulver and Marin Trank that she has no qualms about killing whatsoever. However, here we see that she was determined to learn how to be a killer so much uh, that she suffered through a lot as uh, she suffered through daily beatings, but more than that, she's learned to lose her identity and follow the creed of the faceless men. Now, there has been some debate on how her sight got restored, but I'll just say the faceless men's magic is mysterious. And also some debate on whether or not she is truly no one at this point and stage in her life, has a needle is still out there, tucked away somewhere. I insist that uh, in this instance, she does believe that she is no one because she has willed it. But deep down in the heart of hearts, she knows she's Arya, but I think Jack knows this too, because he always knows everything about her and can always tell when she's lying even to herself. And further... Despite what he claims, I think that Jacken is totally okay with this. In fact, I think this is what he wants, but more on that later. So Arya continues to train with the Waif, but even with her side back, the Waif still kicks her ass. She taunts her that she should just give up, and this angers Arya to fight harder, but the Waif still beats the other loving crap out of her and states that she will never be one of them. However, Jacken takes her down to the Hall of Faces and gives her another chance. He holds out the poison vial to Arya again, and, simply, and Arya takes it and simply asks, who? He states an actress named Lady Crane, but warns that this is her second chance and that she will not get a third. And either way, a face will be added to the wall. Meaning if she fails this time, it is he, she who will die. Or is that what he means? But more on that later. Uh, so we see Arya go to watch the plane that Lady Crane is in, and it turns out to be a play about the events of King's Landing, but it's told from the perspective of Lannister propaganda, so it paints the Lannisters in a positive light and the Starks in a very negative light. It presents Tyrion as the villain and Ned Stark as a buffoon and Joffrey as the innocent hero. And Cersei is also portrayed possibly as a lady of high honor, uh... Where, uh, who is played by Lady Crane, who is uh, Arya's mark. So no doubt this is Jacken testing Arya to see if she is truly no one, if she truly has lost her identity, uh, as he forces her to watch a play that bashes her family, and the woman she is sent to kill is an actress who plays Cersei, a woman on Arya's kill list. However, Arya sneaks backstage and sees the actors uh, interacting with one another, and she takes a liking to Lady Crane and recognizes that she's a decent person. She also learns the best way to kill her, as she often drinks rum and is the only one backstage to do so, so all she needs to do is poison the rum. However, she seems to have her doubts as she asks Jack a lot of questions on uh, who wants Lady Crane dead, but he doesn't answer, but she uh, figures that it's the younger actress who plays Sansa because she wants her part. But Jacken says that she must decide if she wants to serve the many-faced god, and she says that she does. But Jacken simply replies uh, that a servant does not ask questions. So that appears to be that. 
So Arya returns to the play where they depict Joffrey's death and when the rest of the audience snickers and boos, Arya laughs and smiles, which draws some attention to her, but it shows her taking delight at the sight of Joffrey's death, which is certainly showing a trait as Arya. However, Arya is moved by Lady Crane's performance and I think she sees in it all the grief and anguish that she's experienced throughout the years so really connects with it and when she sneaks backstage again lady crane spots her and they have a talk where Arya shows her appreciation of her and they seem to connect where Arya suggests her final speech should be more about anger and wanting revenge crane seems to like this and asks her if uh she's uh likes to pretend to be other people which is more true than she knows However, when Lady Crane goes to drink the poisoned rum, Arya knocks it out of her hand and tells her to be careful and then points to the younger actress and says that she wants her dead. Arya then goes straight to recover Needle and then finds a dark room to hide in. So she has decided that she isn't no one, she's Arya Stark. Several things were probably the catalyst for this. One was the play which reminded her of where she came from and the people who are on her kill list are still out there. Instead of going after those who wronged her, she is meant to kill a decent and innocent person that she likes and that does not sit well with her. When Jacken sent Arya to kill the thin man, she was fine with that. After all, he was a scummy man who took advantage of desperate families. Although he hadn't wronged her personally, she didn't personally want revenge on him. He was still a scummy man, so she had no issue with killing him. But Lady Crane, she did recognize as a decent person, and she was asked to kill her because another girl was jealous, and that did not sit right with her. Just like when Arya had no issue with killing Pulliver and his men, but was outraged when the hound betrayed and stole from the farmer, because she does have a code. She does have a sense of what is right and what is wrong and who is deserving of death and who isn't, but the faceless men clearly don't, as they are simply assassins for hire who kill whoever they are paid to. And Arya realizes that it, that is not the life for her, so she reclaims Needle, which is the surest sign of reclaiming her identity as Arya Stark. To that end, while she's roaming the city, she comes across a sailor from Westeros and books passage back to Westeros and plans to leave uh, the next day. But as she's looking over Bravo saying her goodbyes, an old lady approaches her, but then stabs her multiple times and it turns out to be the waif coming to kill her for failing her mission to kill Lady Crane. Arya fights her off and then jumps in the canal to escape, but she's hurt and injured. So... This analysis video isn't really about criticizing, but it's hard not to notice how inconsistent the writing is here for Arya to be caught so off guard when she knows the faceless men would be looking for her, and of course the fact that she survived getting stabbed multiple times in the gut. So it feels like if I attempt to analyze this, it will be making excuses for it, which I don't want to do, so I'll just skip. So Arya, uh, hurt and severely injured with no one uh, there to help her, she goes to seek refuge with Lady Crane, who instantly wants to help her, so tends to her wounds. She claims to have had a lot of practice stitching wounds of her past boyfriends that made her angry, and again, I'll hold my criticism. But <laughs> while caring for Arya, the two of them bond, and in Lady Crane, Arya finds a mother figure which is quite significant for her character journey. As on her journey, Arya has had many father figures, Urin, Jack, and the Hound, but she's never really had a mother figure, and although her interactions with Lady Crane were brief, I think she did remind her of her mother and what it was like to have a mother. It further uh, connects her to her prior life and further motivation to return to it. However, when she wakes up from her rest, she finds that the waif has caught up to her and has killed Lady Crane, and she refers to it as the many-faced god reclaiming the death that was his, and that he's been promised another name, which of course refers to Arya, and Arya, uh, so she uh, makes a run for it, but the waif follows, which results in an extra-long chase scene across the city where Arya ducks and dodges, trying to lose the waif, but it doesn't work until finally she leaps off a building that results in a rough time which aggravates her wounds and she begins bleeding everywhere. So with her severely injured, the waif hones in on her and prepares to make the kill, but it turns out this whole time that Ari was purposely leading the waif back to her room where she had needles stashed, stashed away. 
But given how many times the wave had defeated Arya when uh, practicing with fighting with the sticks, uh, the wave is unconcerned, uh, saying that the needle won't help her. But then Arya cuts the candle, extinguishing the light, giving, uh, putting them in pitch darkness, giving Arya the clear advantage. And Arya has already spent weeks, perhaps even months, training to fight when blind. And thus, she kills the wave. So it turns out Arya was cunning and did have a trap plan and the eventuality that the wave had tried to catch up to her, showing that she has learned cunning as well. So then Jack and Hagar returns to the Hall of Faces to find a trail of blood leading to a freshly carved new face on the wall, and that is in fact the face of the waif. Arya confronts Jack and where she holds the needle up to him and accuses him of uh, sending the wave to kill her. Jacken doesn't deny this and in fact walks directly into Needle completely unafraid and unfazed. He says he did send the wave to kill her but the wave is dead and she is not. He then says that she is finally no one but Arya counters that she is not, that she is Arya Stark of Winterfell and she's going home. Jacken looks at her and then a smile creeps across his face and as Arya walks away he has a look that I would describe as a look of a proud father. So there's a lot to unpack here. First off when Jacken had said before he sent Arya on a mission to kill Lady Crane that one way or another a new face would adorn the wall that turned out to be true and it was the waif's face. So I do firmly believe that when he sent the waif to kill her that was uh, a final a very brutal uh, test for Arya to overcome and she did and I think he was very proud of her for doing so because Jacken, while, while he's an assassin one of the highest caliber so he's trained uh, his training techniques aren't going to be very pretty and yes if she had failed his final test she would have died but that's just the kind of teacher he is now, as for Jacken being proud of her when she just denounced the whole faceless training and uh, went off to become her own person, I do firmly believe that this is what he had wanted of her to do all along and what he was pushing her for. If you recall, when he first invited her to come to Bravos at the end of Season 2, she said it would be a way for her to learn uh, to kill all the names that she wanted to kill. Cersei, Joffrey, Ilan Payne, he said it would he would teach her how to kill all those names herself. His invitation wasn't for her to become a faceless man, but for Arya to fulfill her kill list. When she arrived in Bravos, he had first denied knowing her, which was a test, uh, but then he insisted that she, uh, that she needs to become no one in order to become a faceless man and kill whomever she's ordered to kill. But I think that too was just a test, that he never intended for her to become a faceless man, just another assassin, but intended to train her in the ways of the faceless men so she could use these skills for her own purposes, which is exactly what he had promised her at the end of Season 2. Now, the Waif was another one of his pupils who uh, had become angry and jealous of Arya as she didn't feel Arya belonged there, and those feelings were personal and also unbefitting of a faceless man. And so, uh, she was failing at being a faceless man as well. So this was a test for her just as much as it was for Arya, which she failed because she took pleasure in wanting to kill Arya. So I think Jacken sent her for Arya to kill so that Arya could complete uh, her training by uh, <clears throat> passing the final test, and that is defeating a faceless man. And when she did that, she proved that she was now ready to return to Westeros and complete her kill list on her own. And so when Jacken sent her to Lady Crane, he knew it would have the effect of reminding Arya who she was and wanting to reclaim her identity. And that's the exact effect that he wanted it to have because he knew that Arya was never going to be a faceless assassin for hire, but that she was meant to be Arya Stark, a skilled assassin getting revenge on those she desired. And thus, Jack and May had been the most vital mentor that Arya's ever had. Ironically, he's also the least loving and least caring, but he's the one that she learned the most skills from and learned to become what she had always wanted, but never was a truly proficient, deadly, skilled killer. 
Now, <coughs> Arya, for her part, when she said she was Arya Stark of Winterfell and that she was going home, that doesn't mean she wanted to return to Winterfell or to be with her family again. It meant she remembered who she was and that she was returning to Westeros to fulfill Arya Stark's kill list to get revenge on those who've wronged her uh, and her family. Not to kill people that she's been hired to kill, but to kill for a purpose, and that purpose is revenge. This proves to be true, as we don't see her until much later, and she doesn't go north to the Wall or to Winterfell. She goes directly to the Twins, where one of the three names on her kill list uh, remains, and that is Walder Frey. So Arya uses the skills that she learned to infiltrate the twins as she takes the face of a common serving girl and studies and learns what she needs to about the phrase. We first uh, see her before we even realize it's Arya as uh, she's uh, wearing the face of a serving girl and she's serving at a feast where the Lannisters and Freys are celebrating uh, recently retaking River Run. We see the serving girl eyeing up Jamie Lannister and he and Bronn believe that the girl desires him but as we soon learn it's really Arya Stark so what she's really eyeing up is the possibility of killing him. But Jamie isn't on her kill list. Uh, he'd be a nice bonus for sure, but her focus is more on the Freys, who all participated in killing her family and their forces. So we then see Arya as the serving girl, serving Walder Frey pie, and he is upset about it because his two sons aren't there uh, when they're meant to be, but the serving girl keeps insisting that they are there until she points to the pie and Walder uncovers it to see a toe. The serving girl then talks about how they weren't easy to carve, that Black Walder in particular was tough to carve. Now, Black Walder was the one who slit Arya's mother's throat, and both of them participated in the Red Wedding, but of course her main goal was killing Walder Frey, and she removes her the face of the serving girl uh, so that Walder can see who she is, and she proudly announces that she is Arya Stark before she slits his throat, and the look on her face as Walder slowly dies is one of absolute pure pleasure. So this is where Arya's journey has led her, where she experienced one horrible trauma after another and was basically raised on the run by rough and brutal men like Urin, the Hound, and Jack and Hagar, where she learned to be brutal, ruthless, and unfeeling. The only pleasure she gets in life is killing those who wrong her, though she feels and deserve to die. And so that leads us to Season 7, which begins with the scene of Walder Frey throwing a huge party for all the Freys. In fact, he said he has gathered up every Frey of any importance in order to lay out his next plans. But before he does, he wants them to all drink. Drink a toast. So he ensures that all the Freys have a cup, and of course they all drink as a sign of respect to their lord. But he doesn't allow his teenage wife to drink, insisting that he doesn't want to share wine with a woman. He then proclaims them as the phrase who killed the Starks at the Red Wedding, to which they all cheer. But he doesn't seem too pleased about this, and then goes on to describe how they murdered their own guests that trusted them by betraying them and slitting the throats of a good mother. And then all the phrase who just drank start to choke, and one by one they begin dropping dead. And then, of course... Walder removes his face to reveal it is in fact Arya, which of course he is because Walder's dead. <laughs> so we should have known all this time this is Arya Stark pretending to be him. However, Arya has spared all the serving girls and a Walder's wife whom she turns to and tells her that when she speaks of what happened here to tell people that winter came for House Frey. And then she proceeds to leave as she walks through dozens of dead bodies from the people she just poisoned, and she leaves with a huge smile on her face. So this shows how skilled she has become after her time at the House of Black and White, that she is able to fashion her own face to uh, where she wore the face of Walder Frey and pretended to be him for over a week, showing how skilled she is at uh, pretending to be other people, as during the toast she did manage to sound a lot like Walder Frey, using his speech patterns and his mannerisms. Uh, now, no doubt she studied him while, uh, for a while before killing him so that she could learn to do so. And thus she slaughtered 
all of the Freys, much in the same way that they slaughtered all of the Starks, but she made a point to spare the women and the serving girls, illustrating that as far gone as Arya is now, uh, where she takes perverse pleasure in slaying dozens of men, she still has a code. Just like the Hound said, everyone has to have a code, and she still does not want to kill innocents, unlike the Faceless Men, and she only wants to kill those she feels deserve it, but when she does, she takes extreme pleasure from it, which regardless of how many phrase, how much the phrase deserved it, it's still pretty fucked up. So, <clears throat> while she's riding along, alone in the Riverlands, she comes across a group of Lannister soldiers having a meal by a campfire, and they invite her to share in their meal. She's suspicious at first and ready for a fight, as she sees Lannister soldiers as uh, enemies, but they're kind to her, and talking to them, she learns that they're just average everyday people with their own families, their own hopes and dreams, and perhaps a blurs the lines between who Arya considers deserving of death or not. When they ask her uh, where she's going, she simply says she's going to King's Landing to kill the Queen, which is blatant and honest. It almost seems like she was trying to provoke a fight, or at least test them to see how they would respond. After all, Arya is now very adept and experience at making up stories and pretending to be someone else, so for her to be so blatantly honest like this was definitely a calculated decision. However, they simply laugh and take it as a joke, and the fact that they're okay with people joking about killing Cersei makes them okay in her books, so she laughs along with them, lets them think that she was just joking, when really she isn't. Uh, so, this experience, I believe, did help ground her and humanize her and show her that the world isn't all a horrible place, which perhaps contributes to her making the decision that she's about to make. So next time we see Arya, she arrives at the crossroads, uh, both literally and figuratively, as she comes across the inn at the crossroads, where she had left Hot Pie in Season 3, and he's still working there and is delighted to see her. So they have a nice reunion. However, Arya does seem a bit awkward. All the time she spent with the Faceless Men didn't do much for her social skills. When Hot Pie asks her what happened to her, she gets a distant look, like she's prepared to tell him uh, and about her stories and her travels since the last time they saw each other, but instead she just shakes her head and changes the subject. But when Arya brings up Cersei, Hot Pie mentions that he heard uh, that uh, she blew up the set of Baylor, and he can't believe anyone would do that, but Arya simply replies, Cersei would do that. And you could hear the hate in her voice, as she still has a very keen hatred of Cersei and desire to kill her. So it's clear her determination to finish off her kill list, which only has two names remaining, Cersei and the Mountain, both of which are in King's Landing. But Hot Pie then asks where she's, uh, why she's not going to Winterfell, but she responds by saying, why would, I, why would I go there? The Boltons have it. But Hot Pie informs her that that isn't the case, that Jon Snow came down from the wall and won the Battle of Bastards and reclaimed Winterfell for the Starks, and that he is now King of the North, which is indeed big news for Arya, because... All this time on the run, she's learned to accept the fact that she has no home, and no true family anymore, but now she gets the news she does have a home, she does have a family that's being led by the sibling that she was always closest to. Arya then farewells Hot Pie and wishes him well. You can tell her sentiments are genuine, and although she was a bit awkward with him, she does care about him, and he returns her sentiments. But then Arya has a big choice to make. Should she continue onward to King's Landing to complete her kill list, fulfill her revenge, or should she return home finally to be with her family again, something that she hasn't had since her father was killed all those years ago? So, she was definitely really conflicted about this, and as I mentioned, this isn't the first time she had to make this decision, but now, for the first time, she does have a true home to return to, so she does decide to head north and return to Winterfell. And I think her interactions with the Lannister soldiers and with Lady Crane reminded her of how important it is to be with family again, uh, to have someone to care about. 
But, ironically, this decision will have dire consequences for thousands of lives as Cersei is about to make a bunch of horrible decisions in her war with Daenerys that Arya could have put a stop to if she had just killed her. But that's a discussion for another time. So, on her way back north, while camped for the night, she is approached by a vicious pack of wolves. And just as she prepares to fight them off, she sees a dire wolf that is twice the size of the other wolf, so it is clearly her own dire wolf that she had as a child, Nymeria, whom she had let free into the Riverlands to protect her from Joffrey all those years ago. Arya reaches out to her and begs her to return to Winterfell with her. Nymeria does appear to recognize her as she doesn't attack and her, her and her wolves stand down, but she doesn't go with Arya and instead leads her new wolf pack elsewhere in the Riverlands. And so, with this, uh, the realization that Nym Nymeri has changed, Arya says, well, that isn't you. Which is a callback to when her, what she said to her father, when her father told her that she was destined to become a lady who married a lord and looked after the children, she simply said, that isn't me. And Arya realizes that Nymeria is no longer her household pet and has grown into a different wolf as well, and where she now leads a giant wolf pack. So this is a realization for Arya that one can never truly go home, and one can never really reclaim what they once had because things uh, change people, and things have changed uh, forever and will always be different. So Arya finally arrives at Winterfell, but the guards don't believe her when she says who she is, as Arya is believed to long to be long dead. When she tells them to ask her brother John the King, they inform her that he's traveling and is thousands of miles away. So Arya then inquires on who's in charge, and they tell her that Sansa is, whom they refer to as Lady Stark. She convinces them to let her see Sansa, even though they still don't believe she is who she says she is. But when she's in Winterfell, she has the feeling of being home, and so easily evades the guards and goes to the crypts of Winterfell to visit her father's tomb. And Sansa finds her there, and the two of them have a nice reunion. So, more and more, Arya's feeling like the child she once was, and the, for, for the first time in years, is finally reconnecting with her family. Arya asks Sansa about if she killed Joffrey, like people said she did, but Sansa admits that she did not, but wished that she had. Arya reflects the same sentiment, saying that Joffrey was the first name on her kill list. Uh, Sansa asks about her list, and when Arya says it's a list of people she wants to kill, Sansa laughs and takes it as a joke, and again, Arya laughs along with her and lets her think it's a joke. Sansa then reveals that Bran has returned home as well and she takes her to see him and Arya embraces him uh, when she sees him. But Bran, like Arya, seems more cold and distant and tells her that he saw her at the crossroads and wasn't sure if she'd come home or go to King's Landing. When she's puzzled by this, Sansa clarifies that Bran has visions, and Arya isn't, uh, isn't at all skeptical about it, and takes it at face value. No doubt, with all the magic that she's seen uh, involving the faceless men, it's made her more accepting of things that are more supernatural. When Sansa asks uh, where else she could have gone, Bran clarifies to King's Landing to kill Cersei, because she's on her list. Now Sansa begins to take this list seriously and starts to suspect there's more to Arya than she thought. They also reveal that Littlefinger is now in Winterfell and has declared for House Stark, which surprises Arya as she remembers him as being one of the royal court who oversaw her father's execution. Although he was never specifically on her kill list, she didn't think too kindly of him. Bran then gives Arya a Valerian steel dagger that Littlefinger had apparently given him as a gift, but he says that he doesn't need it and thinks Arya would make much better use of it. Later, Arya comes across Brienne of Tarth, training Podrick in the courtyard, and intersects that, uh, that he should never fight anyone like her in the first place. No doubt Arya had already been informed that Brienne was there, had, that Brienne had saved her sister from the Boltons, so she now has a higher opinion of her than the last time they met. 
Uh, she then asks to train with Brienne as she needs someone to train with, but Brienne doesn't really take her seriously and offers to fetch the Master of Arms, but Arya insists that she wants to train with her, with the one who defeated the Hound, meaning her opinion of Brienne is really high indeed. When Brienne at first refuses Arya, she then brings up the fact that Brienne has sworn to serve both her mother's daughters, which includes her. So Brienne agrees, but still doesn't take Arya seriously, and when she attempts to use Needle, Brienne says that she can't because it's too small, but Arya simply says that, oh, don't worry, I won't cut you. So Brienne proceeds and treats Arya like a novice, and each time is easily beaded by her. So it finally starts to dawn on her the type of fighter that she is. Arya is using the skills of water dancing that she learned from Cyril, and the stealthy fighting skills she learned from the Faceless Men, and thus is quicker and more agile than what Brienne is more is used to. So Brienne stops holding back and goes full tilt on Arya, who keeps pace. When Brienne kicks Arya to the ground, she at first looks worried that maybe she went too far, but Arya simply jumps back to her feet with a smile on her face. So they continue to spar full tilt. Brienne manages to knock Arya's sword out of her hand, but she simply ducks and dodges until she can pull her dagger on Brienne just as she pulls her sword on her, bringing the fight to a draw. No doubt Brienne is seen by those who know her as one of the best fighters in Westeros, having defeated some of the best-known swordsmen in Westeros, like Loras Tyrell and the Hound. And Arya managed to hold her own and bring the fight to a draw, meaning she has just illustrated that she is now one of the best fighters in Westeros as well. Brienne simply asks who taught her how to do that, and Arya replies, no one, which is a clever little reference to the Faceless Men. However, Sansa was observing this fight the whole time and is frankly frightened by how skilled a fighter Arya has now become, as it shows that she doesn't really know her sister anymore, which is frankly true. However, when Arya starts to see the daily functions of Winterfell, she's not very happy with what she sees, as the Lords of the North are complaining about Jon Snow and how he left the North, and she seems pleased when Arya sticks up for him and insists that Jon is king in the North. However, when they're in private, Arya expresses her dissatisfaction with how the Lords are treating Jon and suggests perhaps they should simply cut off their heads. But Sansa explains that's not how politics works, uh, the way they retook Winterfell with, was with the support of all these lords, and they're going to uh, need to they're going to need their continued support. Now, this illustrates how different backgrounds uh, Arya and Sansa come from. As Sansa was taught more in the ways of politicking and gaining support, and you know playing politics, where Arya's experience has taught her more violence in the way things operate and more chaos. Of course, in this case, Sansa is correct. However, Arya sees this as trying to supplant Jon and claiming the North for herself. So this is the past feud that Arya and Sansa had uh, beginning to reassert itself as they never did get along as children and Arya had a very, always had a lofty opinion of Sansa as she remembers her sticking up for Joffrey when her dire wolf was killed and when her friend the butch butcher's boy was killed so uh, she's starting to not trust her. Someone else uh, she really doesn't trust is Littlefinger, whom she spots talking to some of the other lords of the north, and she gets suspicious, so she follows him. She then witnesses the maester delivering something to Littlefinger in secret, and when he leaves the room, she breaks in, searches it, and finds a letter that Sansa had wrote as a child, a letter that she wrote to Rob, begging him to surrender to Joffrey and pledge allegiance to him. Now, again, this is another time I'm going to have to leave my personal opinion out of it. There are frankly many times from here on out where I'll have to do this and try to focus on what the show is trying to portray rather than the sloppy way in which they're doing it. As we learn, Littlefinger is playing Arya and planted that letter there for her to find in order to pit the two sisters against each other. And if Arya is as skilled as the warrior faces men as uh, they're presenting her to be, I don't think she would have fallen for this, but what? Ever. So the next time Arya and see Sansa, she tells a story about their father and how he encouraged her, and at first this appears to Sansa that uh, she's reminiscing with her, but then Arya accuses her of betraying 
uh, her father and participating in his execution. She then shows her the letter that she found and reads it aloud to prove that Sansa is a traitor. Sansa insists that the Lannisters forced her to write it, but Arya asks if they tortured her physically. Did they rake her bones? Did they put a knife to her throat? And when Sansa says she was only a child, Arya says that she was only a child too, and she would have made them kill her before betraying her family like this. Which very well may be true, but Arya is judging Sansa by her own standards. The two of them had very diff different upbringings and very different journeys after their father's death. Where Arya was a simple uh, you know, more of a simple one about survival, but Sansa's was more complex and about the ways of politics. And Arya is being completely unreasonable here, as uh, had she simply let the Lannisters kill her, that arguably would uh, not be the right thing to do, as Sansa managed to accomplish a lot more by playing along with the Lannisters. Indeed, Sansa insists that she did it because she thought it was the only way to save their father's life, but Arya simply calls Sansa stupid for believing that. Again, she's being unfair to Sansa because Arya, too, was naive at that age. Indeed, when Arya mentions that she, um, she was at their father's execution, Sansa rightfully points out that she didn't try to stop them from executing her father or try to fight off the guards because, like her, she knew that would be stupid and there was nothing they could do. But this doesn't appease Arya, who insists that she betrayed her family. Sansa then says that she should be on her knees thanking her for retaking Winterfell, saying that she didn't, that Arya didn't do it, Jon didn't do it because he lost the battle. It was her getting the Knights of the Vale that won the battle and re, uh, won them Winterfell. So she did much more for her family than Arya did. Uh, who was just off somewhere training, which is pretty much true. However, she then says that uh, she suffered a lot of things that Arya would not have survived. Uh, but that's where I think she's wrong, as Arya had suffered a lot as well. Different things in different ways, sure, but she had proven to be just as resilient. And this is where the whole problem lies. The two sisters don't really know each other or what the other one has become or what they've been through since they were last together. And instead of learning who they are now, they just jump to conflict. And this is, uh, to be fair, mostly Arya's fault, but her time with the Faceless Men and roaming the Riverlands in constant fear of her life has taught her to see the worst in people. However, Arya clearly threatened, uh, is threatening Sansa by threatening to share the letter to the Northern Lords, which would weaken her position, so Sansa breaks into Arya's room, no doubt looking for the letter, but Arya was clearly prepared for this, and instead of the letter, Sansa finds some of Arya's faces, and so uh, Sansa comes to truly fear Arya. Arya then shows up, tells her uh, that uh, she got the faces when training with, to be a faceless man, and when Sansa asks what that means, Arya doesn't answer, and instead insists on playing the game of faces with her, so that she can judge if Sansa is lying or not. She then asks Sansa if she's happy with Jon being king, or if she wants to rule the North herself. Sansa refuses to play along and ask her about the faces instead, so Arya tells her that she's able to take the identity of those she kills, and then suggests that perhaps she could become Sansa, which truly frightens her, as I think that's the whole point. But instead of moving against her, she hands Sansa the, the, uh, the dagger, and this is another case of, well, for me, this is another case of nothing nice to say than don't say anything at all, so let's just move on. Now, most of what happened next happens off-screen, so it's mostly speculation, but we do see Littlefinger trying to convince Sansa that Arya wants to kill her in order to claim the North for herself, but then Sansa apparently goes to Bran, who ha uh, with, has this gift of green sight. He tells Sansa what really happened, and that Littlefinger is trying to drive a wedge between the two sisters uh, so he can get Arya out of his way, whom he perceives as a threat. He also tells Sansa of Littlefinger's misdeeds, such as his part in their father's execution. So again, all this happens off screen. Apparently Sansa goes to Arya and informs her of this, and the two of them make a pact and make peace with each other and agree to work together to take Littlefinger down. 
boy, far too much has happened off screen. But again, not going to get into this here. So Sansa calls a court where it appears like she's going to do a little fingers bidding and put Arya on trial. And she calls her in like she's going to be executed. But instead, Sansa turns to Littlefinger and puts him on trial, accusing him of the things Bran revealed uh, that Littlefinger did, such as participating in their father's murder, starting the War of the Five Kings by poisoning John Aaron and convincing Liza to blame the death on the Lannisters, thus beginning the whole conflict between the Starks and the Lannisters. Littlefinger denies the charges, but Bran brings up specifics that prove that he is guilty. And Arya goes along with this, and when Sansa pronounces Littlefinger guilty, she has Arya execute him. Now again, I'll leave my criticisms of this very flawed scene out of it and point out that this is an example of the three Stark siblings coming together and using their differences to complement one another and to work together rather than fighting one another. As Bran using his green sight to show them the truth, Sansa uses her skills in showmanship and politics to declare Littlefinger a traitor in front of all the northern lords, and Arya uses her skills as a killer to carry out the execution, and thus the two sisters do learn how to come together with who they are now. And so we then see the two sisters come together and complement each other and vow to do what's best for the North in the coming battle against the White Walkers and the inner conflicts of the South. Arya assures Sansa that she did the right thing and that Sansa is now the Lady of Winterfell. When Sansa asks her if that bothers her, she says that she was never going to be a lady and that a job lays more with Sansa. And Sansa replies that Arya is the strongest person that she knows. Sansa then quotes their father about how the lone wolf dies, but the pack survives, meaning they both learn the importance of coming together as a family, meaning Arya's true focus from wanting revenge on those who wronged her has now changed. And now she has learned that her true objective is to stand with her family and ensure their survival. And in that way, she has truly reclaimed the identity of Arya Stark that she had lost a long time ago. So that brings us to the end of Season 7 and only one more chapter left to be told in Season 8 where it will... I'm very curious to see where Arya's path uh, will take her. Will she remain with her family to the end or will she once again strike out on her own? As that, <coughs> for the longest time, has been the only life that she's ever known. Will she ever finish her kill list, or has she now moved past those desires of revenge? I'm curious to see how Season 8 will cover this, and hopefully it will be less flawed than her story in Season 7, but we'll see. So that's it for my analysis of Arya Stark's character journey. Thank you so much for sticking with me through this very long video. I do plan on doing more character analysis videos for other Game of Thrones characters on the lead up to Season 8, but I'm going to try to make those other videos really shorter and more succinct. But with Arya, it's, Arya has always been one of my favorite characters, so I wanted to give her the detail I think her story deserved. But be sure to check out my channel for much, much more Game of Thrones videos to come, as well as many other videos and other shows like Star Trek, The Expanse, Babylon 5, and more. So be sure to subscribe so you can keep up with all of that. And thanks a lot for watching.